Welcome, welcome. I am so excited to have Matthew Pollard as a guest on Your Career Cure. And the reason why I was drawn to Matthew, and he's going to fill in all the blanks for you, is, of course, there's a dog barking now. Okay, this is live. We're good. Um, is because I'm an introvert and he wrote a book about introverts. So without further ado, Matthew, can you dig deeper into your background and your book on introverts and all that good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I'm ecstatic too. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I never felt that I'd be the person on podcast interviews, speaking from stage, talking about my journey as an introvert, because I mean, I should never have been here. I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. I was horribly introverted. You know, my, my bad acne, the colored lenses that I ended up having to wear to fix my reading issues and, and braces just left me in this position where I just, I didn't feel super comfortable in, around my own friends, let alone anyone else. Uh, but, you know, by happenstance, which we can go into detail more later, you know, because I lost my job just before Christmas, because Australia tends to take a month off over Christmas, uh, because it's summer and Christmas at the same time, I fell into a door to door sales role, because it was the only job I could get. And after 93 doors for my first sale, I started the process of systemizing sales and I basically taught myself how to sell watching YouTube videos. And, you know, within the space of six weeks, I went from having no business being in sales, scared to be in sales, really, to being the number one person in that company, which happened to be the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. So fast forward just shy of a decade, I've been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. When I moved to the US, I started to share this content. And what I found is I'd talk about what I call the three steps to rapid growth, how to differentiate, how to niche, and how to create a sales system, and explained why so many entrepreneurs, they're so great at their functional skill, but they find that because they limit themselves from, they don't focus on these three things, whether they're not putting energy into it, or they're subconsciously avoiding it, they end up in this constant hamster wheel of struggling to find interested prospects, setting themselves apart and trying to make the sale while thinking everyone cares about price, which they don't, but they commoditize themselves so much. It's the only decision people can make a, you know, a great decision on is price. So what was interesting though, is when I started presenting these concepts from stage, before I got into talking about sales, I had, I, I felt like it was important to kind of cut myself down a peg and, and share my own personal story. And I'd share my own personal journey around how I became successful in sales. And I put up a photo of me at my sister's wedding with horrible acne, which took me a while to build up the confidence to do that. And I just had so many introverts afterwards that said, well, your, your content was great, but I just never knew as an introvert that I could sell. And, you know, that is transformational transformational for me because as a career professional, I never went into business for myself because I wasn't sure that I could do that. Or, you know, in my own business, I'm just, I'm, I'm accepting subpar performance because I thought that I was a second class citizen in some way, shape or form. So for me, I started telling everybody that I knew that was a sales expert that somebody needed to write a book on introverted selling. And everyone said to me, Matt, no one's ever going to buy a book on introverted sales. I mean, introverts don't want to sell. Well, eventually I ended up working with a ghostwriter that was a client of mine that I took from really, I mean, he made 27,000 in 2013 and 12,000 by October when we started to work together of October of 2014. And literally by the end of the year, he'd made 120. The following year, he made sh just shy of 300. And he convinced me that together with a ghostwriter, we could, we could put together a book. And well, I mean, we launched it in 2018. It sold, it sold 42 and a half thousand copies so far. It's been translated into 10 languages, uh, well, more than 10 languages now. It's been listed by HubSpot as one of the most highly rated sales books of all time. And it's been listed by Book Authority as the number two book ever written for introverts. So the market just exploded and we decided that we were going to turn it into a series. So we launched the Introverts Edge to Networking in January this year. And I mean, it's already, you know, three times the sales of, of, of what the first book had did, done in the same, in the same sort of time frame. And it's just, I mean, it's just allowed us to help so many other people because instead of just focusing on salespeople or people that open their own business, it teaches career professionals and small business owners how to leverage the networking room in a strategic way so that they don't have to go into a room feeling like they have to say, do you want to buy from me? Do you want to hire me? Do you want to buy from me? Which nobody likes to do that transactional stuff, but also shows them a way that they don't have 
have to be that aimless networker that just has all these shallow conversations, walks out with all these business cards that they never call and those people never call them. It makes them believe that networking is really just a waste of time. So at the moment we have two books, there'll be a series of books coming out, but it's just great to see every one of these books help introverts realize that they're not second class citizens, their path to success is just different to that of an extrovert and helping them embrace that allows them to attain successes that they never thought possible, which has been great to see. That's awesome. That's really awesome. I mean, there is such a need, and it doesn't shock me that your book is doing amazing because there are so many people that are introverts. And a lot of times we don't think a person is an introvert, right? I think there's a big difference though be between being an introvert and also sh being shy. And I think people get that mixed up as well shyness versus being introverted because you could be an introvert and not be shy you no, could you're be 100 right i mean right? everybody gets this confused and i have to tell you i mean psychologists earn a living making it more complicated so the the thing that i'll tell you like if you see john lee dumas we, he was just on your show before mm -hmm. me, right? He's obviously an extrovert and he will tell everybody that he's an extrovert. You get someone like me to speak. If, if I wasn't talking about introversion right now, everyone would just naturally assume that I've got that gift of gab. Yeah. And the reason why I come across that way is planning, preparation, strategy, things that, by the way, introverts are amazing at. Uh, the problem is that we see people that are successful and we project extroversion upon them. I, know, I mean, I know I do this. I remember watching a, a guy speak from stage and his um, name was Dan Walsh, Walsh and I was just beginning to speak from stage. I remember seeing this guy going, one day I hope to be that good, but gosh, I'm an introvert. And even I do this, I teach this stuff and even I do it. And afterwards we got talking, he's an introvert. He gets, he has his process just like I now have mine for doing interviews, speaking from stage, networking and selling that allows me to be successful. But let's call it what it is. I mean, if you look at someone like Zig Ziglar, the person mm -hmm. that, I mean, if you think about somebody that's the most well-known for sales training and speaking from stage, well, he was an introvert. I interviewed his, his son, Tom Ziegler, on my podcast, The Introvert's Edge, and he talked about his dad's strategies for coping as an introvert, you know, having to speak all the time. If you look at uh, networking, Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, I mean, this is a 10,000 membership groups across the globe. You'd think the person that founded that had to be an extrovert. No, he was an introvert. He created it to create system and process around networking. Ivan Meisner, I've interviewed him a few times, and he's always talking about strategies and systems. If you look at big brands like billion dollar brand Ugg Boots, the big sheepskin boot company, the person that founded that, Brian Smith, he was an introvert. There's so many people that we project extroversion upon because we see them as successful, because we see them as dynamic. And a lot of these people are driven by passion and mission. A lot of them have just practiced and prepared so that they present not a fake version of themselves, not an extroverted version of themselves, but the best version of themselves in a highly prepared way. But if we come back to the true essence of what introversion is, Yes, there is shyness. Yes, there's highly sensitive people. But all of this makes things highly complicated. Let's keep it super, super simple. If you hang out with a group of people at a networking event, whether you enjoy it or not, because extroverts, there are some extroverts that can't stand networking. But if you walk out of that exhausted, you're an introvert. If you walk out of it charged up, then you're an extrovert. It's purely that, where you draw your energy from. It doesn't matter whether or not you're good at it or not. It doesn't matter whether you enjoy it or not because you can create systems and processes around that. For me though, I found that introverts especially, it's a lot more emotionally tolling and therefore takes a lot more energy to sell and network because they're really bad at it and they haven't practiced and perfect the system. But if you have an external system and you evaluate that system and you're always perfecting it, the great thing is it becomes less about you and more about the system. So it's less emotionally tolling, which actually means that it still exhausts you, but not as much. But what right. I will tell you is every introvert will learn to enjoy or can learn to enjoy to sell, to network, to speak from stage, but like a kid at Disneyland, they're just tired afterwards. Right. And I think what happens is you also tend to avoid it because you feel like you're bad at it. And then it just perpetuates and then you avoid it and you don't do it. And then you're not good at it because you're not practicing. And I think it comes down to practice. Um, practice and system. And that's yeah, the exactly. Thing that I find. So, I mean, you can practice 
so you know, the, I mean, I introverts really struggle with the elevator pitch, right? So you can practice the elevator pitch over and over and over again, but it doesn't matter how many times you practice it. When you get to a networking event, you may not say it because it feels contrived, it feels inauthentic, and you because of that, introverts won't use it. Or you'll use it, but you'll say something horrible like, I help this demographic of people with this problem, even if they've got this common objection, but you won't keep eye contact and you'll be kind of, you know, trying to feel, you, 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 people will be able to tell that you're uncomfortable. And the reason for that is if you practice a system that's built for extroverts, if you practice a system that doesn't feel comfortable and authentic to you and your natural skills, then it doesn't matter how much you practice, it's, it's not going to work the way you hope. But in truth, what really happens for the average introvert is we lose our job or we lose our pipeline or a customer leaves us and we're like, okay, I now need to go networking. I don't really want to go, but I have no option. So we look for the closest networking event, we book it in, and then we try our best not to think about it until what we get that reminder 30, 45 minutes before to say, oh, you have to go to that networking event. Then we spend the next 10 to 15 minutes trying to talk ourselves out of going Mm -hmm. Then we finally get in the car. And we spend this whole time thinking, what if no one likes this? This is going to be a waste of time. We walk into the room and then we recognize the per we recognize one person. So what do we do? We attach ourselves to that person for the entire networking mm -hmm. event, or we don't recognize anybody. So we attach ourselves to the very first person we see. Of course, that person sells insurance, which is the last person we want to meet in a networking room. But we that, the fact that we're talking to them, it's still more comfortable than going to the next person. So we stay in that dialogue. We have a series of shallow conversations, and then we leave. Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. We spent no time planning, no time preparing. And then when we get there, we spend no time talking to the people that we actually should be speaking to and all this time speaking to people we already know or people that we, I mean, occasionally you could be lucky, but more often than not, you're not going to be and it's not going to work out the way you, you want. So more often than not, introverts do terribly at networking and extroverts still, even the best ones without a system do just okay all because they don't have a system that where they can contrive their own success. Right. Like walking into a networking event, it's like, I freeze up. I feel so uncomfortable. I mean, you see people that can work a room. I'm so not that person. What I thought what really helped me was um, because in order to grow my business, I'm like, I suck at sales. Like I'm not a salesperson. I just, it feels awkward. It feels contrived. So I thought of like, what can I do that feels comfortable to me? And I think that's really important too. I realize, you know, the systems and all that, but sometimes you do have to go out of your comfort zone. I believe in that. But what helped me was doing speed networking events. And for me, that was just like, boom, boom, boom. It forced me to meet a lot of people, three minutes. You don't get attached onto the next, onto the next, onto the next. And that helped me become more comfortable talking to more people. And then, in fact, that helped me talk to more people when it's not a speed networking type of event. Absolutely. So what you'll find, I mean, what you're really talking about is, is improving that muscle. They, they tell guys that are socially uncomfortable that they should just approach females over and over again, not because they're supposed to be a pickup artist, but because it's about getting over that discomfort from walking up to that person and putting it all on the line. And networking is exactly the same, right? So the speed networking would allow you to do that. But what it's actually doing is it's pushing you to do transactional networking over and over again and trying to and, and helping you practice what to say in doing that. Now, in truth, you can do that practice before you even go to a networking event. But here's the thing that most people struggle with. So when they think about sales, they think about that used car salesman and the right. way that person sells. Well, in truth, it, a great way of selling is a natural step-by-step -step process that leads to a sale. You don't need bulldog techniques. You don't need hard closing. And for introverts, if you pick up a book written by an extrovert that talks about these techniques, we can try them, but it's not going to feel good for us. And we're not going to feel great using these techniques. So they're not going to work as well as they, they should. And in truth, we're probably going to say, oh, I'm just going to avoid sales altogether. So you need to find the step-by-step -step process that leads to a sale. And yes, my book covers that, but I mean, you don't need to buy my book. You can download the first chapter at the 
introvertsedge.com. In that first chapter, I'll get you over that hurdle of believing that you can sell. And then I'll map out that seven step process to selling. And if you do nothing more than look, grab the first seven headlines, look at what you currently say and put it into that, you realize there's some things you say that don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying that to clients. Then you'll realize that some things are out of order. And then there's some gaping holes. Really, most of the holes are around asking great questions and telling great stories because introverts tend to increase jargon in a sale. They open up that fire hose of jargon and, and acronyms and it blows people away. And they say, can you write me a proposal? What they're really saying is I'm mind blown, go away. I'm gonna buy off someone that makes it sound simpler. So sales, if you just do that, you'll be able to double your sales in the next 60 days. Introversion um, for networking is exactly the same. You need a step-by-step -step process. And the goal is not speaking to more people, just like in sales, it shouldn't be a numbers game, right? Yes, it took me 93 doors to make my first sale, but I could focus on, okay, I'm just gonna keep hustling through it and grinding it out every day. But that would be you know, a horrible existence. Instead, I looked at how could I perfect it so that I don't have to be as, I don't have to do that many doors or rely on lady luck. So again, I got it down to an average, you know, I make a sale every three doors, but it came from looking at the system and perfecting the system. Some basic, basic things that nobody does, which blows me away is when I started looking at networking, I went, well, how can I make networking feel like a load of pre-planned meetings? I mean, in truth, I wanna make sure I go to the right event and speak to the right people. Now, if you go into a room completely unplanned, as I said, you might end up speaking to a friend and clinging on to them or speaking to someone that sells insurance. But I mean, I, I remember speaking at a, an event for Intel and it was all the, it was the global leadership event. And I was talking about storytelling and I had this introvert afterwards that came up afterwards and he, you know, he, he spoke to me. I mean, we talked for nearly 30 minutes. It was, you know, I was staying at the hotel he was and we ran into each other. And at the end, he said, Matt, you know, I'm really glad we could have this conversation. See, when it's somebody I feel like I know, I can talk to them forever. But when I don't know enough about them, it feels uncomfortable. And I said, I'm, I'm a little bit blown away by that because isn't this the global leadership event? He said, yeah. I said, do the same people come every year? He's like, yeah. I said, do you have a list of all the people that are coming beforehand? He's like, yes. I said, okay. So let's imagine for a second that there was this tool that you could virtually explore what they were interested in, what they did, what schools they went to, uh, what qualifications and what interests they had. Would you take advantage of that before you came to, to plan who you wanted to speak to and what specific things you could connect on? He said, well, yeah, of course. I said, well, why not pull up LinkedIn? I mean, you can search every single person's profile that's coming to the event and go, oh, this person has this objective or this role within the organization. I bet you I could have a conversation with them and get onto that. Oh, they're part of this leadership group or this committee, or they sit on the board at the AISP, the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals. I would love to be more involved with that group. Now, all of a sudden you can strike up a conversation. You know, I remember going to an event once and I pre-researched this person that I, I, I was a senior leader at Dell and I found out he was super into Peloton. I'm a runner, not a bike rider, but I talked about the fact that the weather was really bad. And I couldn't go for these runs and I was looking for something to do inside, which got them to talk about Peloton for the next 20 minutes. So by doing just a little bit of research, and this is not something that you just do when you work in a career. I mean, if you're going to any networking event, just looking for a job or, you know, looking for clients, you know, what I do, and, you know, in the book, I talk about understanding what your marketplace is, because if I am a customer service person who is looking for a job in customer service, then I'm not the only logical choice for anyone. But if I love the uh, product-based companies that produce widgets, and I'm looking for an organization that likes customer service of mass, that focuses on mass production products, then now all of a sudden I'm a lot more of the right choice to that group. So by knowing who you serve, for instance, I work with introverted service providers to help them obtain rapid growth. So I don't really hang out where product-based companies hang out. I don't really hang out where career professionals hang out. I hang out where the introverted service providers go. Now, when I go to an event, I look, at the, I look them up on meetup.com or I hop on their Facebook page and look at the photos that were recently posted. And I look at the names of the people, I look them up on LinkedIn and I work out who it is that I wanna to speak to. I then connect with them beforehand and say, oh, I'm planning on coming to that event. I noticed that you went last month. You know, I hope you're coming this month because I'd love to run into you. Now, statistically, almost half of the room is going to be introverted, which means that when they see me, if they're introverted, I'm a familiar face, they're gonna walk up and they're gonna to wanna to talk to me. And if not, they're probably going to respond with something like, oh, you'll find it's a great event, especially if I say I'm really passionate about helping introverted service providers 
do a lot of those hang out there, he'll they'll respond with, yes, absolutely. You should absolutely come. So they've kind of unofficially invited me. And now when I go, when I see them, I can go up and have a conversation. And now it feels like a more contrived meeting. Now, if there are people there that are selling real estate and I don't want to buy real estate, I'm probably not going to reach out and connect with them beforehand. If they're selling insurance, I'm probably not. But by doing this, I know who are the important people in the room. I've established conversations prior. And now all I need to know is how to make them feel that I'm valuable and then have a dialogue with them that's not pitchy, that's not self-promotional, but gets them to say, wow, I really like this person. Makes sense. Now, you know, it's interesting because I find, like, what advice would you give to companies that are hiring sales professionals? Because I think there's definitely a bias against people that are introverts, not only for sales, but for other positions such as customer service. I mean, what advice would you give those folks? recruiters and hiring managers about, you know, maybe you should give someone who's an introvert a shot. What do you say about that? Well, first thing they need to look within and say, am I currently stigmatizing the introverts that we already have? Because people will say, oh, Sarah, she's just natural. So, you know, we'll accept, we'll expect high performance from her. But poor Matthew, I mean, Matthew's always been a little bit quiet. So we'll just accept subpar performance. And because of that, you know, we don't push ourselves, right? So the, the first thing is that HR needs to help everyone in the organization as, as an introvert realize that they're not a second class citizen. You've got to stop saying that person couldn't do a leadership role because some of the best leaders in the world are introverted, right? I mean, for gosh sake, we say that introverts can't do small talk, but Oprah Winfrey was an introvert. So how is it that we think that they can't do it? We say that introverts can't be dynamic, but Bill Murray, that famous comedian that we see on things, shows like the Groundhog Day was an introvert. Like Leonardo DiCaprio was an introvert. So first thing as HR managers we need to do is say, okay, we've got to stop stigmatizing. And so we have to stop accepting subpar performance. We've got to stop saying these people can't do this. The second thing we need to do is help them realize that they can because introverts are their own worst enemy, right? We put this kind of artificial wall in and say, I can't do that. And I know I would have been that exact same person. You know, if I didn't lose my job just before Christmas and get thrown into door-to-door -door sales because I was too scared to tell my father that I had nothing lined up, I would never have been a salesperson. I would have been in data entry my whole life and probably been happy with it. But was I really happy or was I just hiding away? And that's the thing. Like as an introvert, you shouldn't be ashamed if you just want to be a writer or you want to do data entry, right? These are great professions, but you shouldn't limit yourself if you want to do other things. Now, I know writers that make more money than great salespeople. I know salespeople that make more money than average writers, right? So it's not about saying one job profession is better than the other, or I can do this because I'm introverted or extroverted. It's about saying, I can do anything that I want. I just need to understand that introversion is a skills gap. Now, a skills gap like anything else, like you think about extroverts, some might say they're not the best listeners in the world. They're not the most empathetic. The difference is HR will send an extrovert that's not that empathetic, not a great listener to a training course to develop them. When they see an introvert, they don't say, oh, that person's an introvert, therefore they have skills gaps, we'll send them to training. We say, oh, we just have to accept subpar performance. So we have to help our introverts realize that they're not second class citizens, that it's a skills gap like anything else. And then because of that, show them systems and processes to sidestep their natural hardships, their natural skills gaps, and leverage the natural strengths of active listening, you know, um, empathy, you know, all of these things, planning, preparation, are great introverted strengths. Now, the other thing that HR needs to do is start sending introverts to training by other introverts. Now, that doesn't mean that if you've got a sales team, you need to send them to Matthew Pollard, because that would seem very self-promotional. But Zig Ziglar was an introvert. Jeb Blunt, is an introvert. Paul Smith is an introvert. Lee Sales is an introvert. Like, gosh, any, most of the sales leaders that you can think of outside Jeffrey Gittemore and Brian Tracy are introverted that I can think of. So you don't need to send them to go and work with me, but you need to work with, get them to work with somebody that doesn't just say it's easy, you just do this and not admit that they're introverts because introverts will, will say, oh, well, it's easy for you, but it's not for me. Now, from a hiring perspective, we've got to stop stigmatizing when we do the hiring approach. For me, the number one requirement for any job is are they willing to learn? Are they willing to hustle? Are they willing to do short-term hard work to get to the outcome? Because I can tell you, you know, for me, 
I, when, when I first started, like literally after five days product training and not a single second of sales training, I got thrown on this road, Sydney Road in Melbourne, Australia. And literally my first door politely rejected me. Then I was sworn at, then I was told to get a real job. And I went home after making $70 for the entire day. And luckily I made a sale wanting to give up. But instead I said, no, sales has to be a system. And I spent eight hours practicing that night what the next step in that system would be. And then I'd go out in the field and work eight hours. Then I'd practice eight hours every night. Weekends, I'd spend 16 hours practicing. But I went from 93 doors to 71, to 48, to 32, to 19, to nine, to three in six weeks. Now, what's funny is a lot of people wouldn't be willing to commit. I mean, it was a terrible six weeks. Most right. people wouldn't be willing to commit to that over 18 weeks, but it transformed my life. So the thing that I would suggest for HR managers is work ethic and belief are the two things, a willingness to learn, a willingness to do the work, and then you have to change their belief that it is possible. But I know that if you can get an introvert to succeed in sales, they're great at paperwork, they're great at customer service, they do so many other things. All things extroverts can learn as well, but we need to separate the trainings because the disadvantages that one group have does not fit the other. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Now, I want to go back to when you did start with sales. Where do you think you would be right now if that never happened to you? Like, do you still think that you somehow down the road would have been doing what you're doing now? Or do you think you would have just been stuck somewhere else if you didn't do the yeah. sales, start with sales. So I can tell you, I definitely wouldn't be doing what I do. I mean, I, I know for a fact, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, so just to, to give you a little bit of the backstory. So I had, a, as I said, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. I had a horrible acne and I actually got diagnosed with dyslexia early, but I was misdiagnosed. Oh. Um, I found out that I had what's called Erlen syndrome, which means I put on this funny pair of colored lenses and miraculously I can learn to read. Now, not like everyone else in my age group, I could start the process of learning to read. Now, I remember hustling in the last two years of high school and I got into the top 20% of my state. But, I mean, my family could see I was exhausted. And I also, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, I applied for a degree in political science and history, right? And it was just because that sounded okay, right? I mean, it wasn't the right choice for me. And my family could see that, firstly, I wouldn't have survived in university if I didn't know exactly what I wanted. But secondly, it was very clear I had no clue. So we agreed that I'd take a gap year. And I mean, I took a year off to do data entry at a real estate agency. And you know, I mean, I wasn't the guy out selling. I was, had a look on my face saying, don't speak to me. I'm here to find myself. And literally three weeks into that job, my manager pulls me aside. He's, man, I'm so sorry, but head office has just decided to close down this premise. You're, you're out of work. And literally it was summer and Christmas in Australia at the same time. So, I mean, we go on holidays from the 20th of December. We don't come back to the 15th or 20th of January. There is no one hiring. So if you think about it, like if you're about, to, if you run your own business and you're about to go on a month long holiday, I mean, there's no jobs available. The only jobs I could find were these things called commission only sales roles. Now there were three jobs I applied for all three uh, interviews and I got all three and then I got all three jobs. So I'm like, oh, you know, maybe I could be good at this. Well, my manager that hired me for the business to business telecommunications role that I ended up taking on, pretty, you know, he put that to bed pretty quickly. He said, mate, we just hire everyone. We throw mud up against the wall, we see what <laughs> sticks. Fun saying, unless you're the mud, I guess. But so it was happenstance that led to that. But I believe that if, it, if that happenstance hadn't have happened, I think that I probably would have stayed in just a menial job in Australia. Maybe I, I wouldn't have even gone back to do my degree. I mean, I went back and did postgraduate study later, but I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, or I probably would have gone back and studied some form of other qualification, got through it and looked for a, a low level medium job. I mean, I've always had that hustle about me. I've always been willing to do the work. I've always been willing to say, I'm not willing to accept subpar from myself. But, you know, maybe I would have got into a data entry role and been, you know, one of the middle managers in a big company doing data entry. And I would have been quite happy. And that's the thing. I'm not saying you won't be happy unless you learn these skills. But right. if these skills are getting in the way of you being happy, if you're following your dream career for you to have your dream business, then you've got to start focusing on them. Don't say, oh, no, you know, it's never going to be possible for me or I'll get around to it eventually. I mean, you're already great at your functional skill. That is probably incredibly true. So when you start your business, focus on the things that are going to allow you to get out of that hamster wheel of chasing prospects and, and, and then making you feel disrespected because you, they don't see the value in what you provide. Right. 
that makes sense. And you also mentioned that you went to YouTube uh, to learn about sales. Who was your inspiration on YouTube? Look, there were a ton back then. I have to say, I did watch quite a few Zig Ziglar videos. So it's mm-hmm. funny later to find out that he was an, that he was an introvert. There's a guy called Kerwin Ray that I thought was really powerful as well. Uh, but for me, I always suggest for those people that are at home, and, and it's funny, the amount of people that buy programs or go to seminars before they experience YouTube. And there's, t- there's tons of content. I mean, I put a ton of videos out on YouTube as well, just to repay the debt, because that's how I learned. But I mean, I just typed in sales system. And then I looked for all the different types of systems. And I found one and I wrote down the steps. And then I focused every day on typing in one of those steps and looking at all the videos that came out. And just, you know, going through one at a time, um, you know, till, till I found like I was comfortable at them. So for me, I mean, Zig Ziglar was great, you know, Kerwin and Ray was great, but for me, I would suggest to people that they find a system and it doesn't need to be sales. It could be networking. It could be leadership. You know, when I got, you know, what happened about six weeks in, because I, my manager pulled me into the office and he, he had this puzzled look on his face. And I remember, I mean, I was the quiet guy that handed my paperwork in downstairs, didn't really speak to anyone. And, you know, I I listened to all the boisterous salespeople talk about how they got that deal and how tough the market was getting. And I remember my manager kind of looking at me blown away saying, Matt, we just got our national sales figures and you're the number one salesperson in the company. And as I said, it's the number one sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. But then naturally he said, oh, if you can sell, you probably can manage. So he promoted me. I don't know why people think because you can sell, you can manage. I got given a training group of 20 people. All of them quit within 24 hours. So I went back to YouTube and I typed in leadership skills and I learned how to, how to be a great manager. And then I got promoted seven times, started my own business and the rest is history. That's awesome. But it's all, <laughs> like YouTube's such a powerful the pa- tool. Yeah, the power of YouTube. As long as you go to the right person, right? Because there's so much noise on YouTube. You got to be careful, but Absolutely. And that's awesome. Think- And that's why I think podcasts are so great as well, because, you know, for me, I mean, these weren't existing back then, but one of the things that you'll find that I do now is I listen to podcast interviews to decide what mentors or what books I want to read. And then I'll read their books after that. And then I'll start to look deep into their content. So a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll hear one person, they won't really resonate with it. And then they'll, they'll, they'll go between lots and lots of people. And I, for some reason these days, people feel like synthesizing systems is a great idea. And it's not, I mean, with sales, I mean, sales is not like mixed martial arts, right? It's not better if you know multiple systems, it's just confusing, right? So regardless, and as I say, I mean, if you're an extrovert listening and you know, you, you've got to go and look for somebody that was extroverted that'll show you how to do it. If you're an introvert, Fine, you know, if you're looking for leadership skills, there's some great introverted leaders um, leadership training out there. If you're looking at entrepreneurship or networking or sales, you know, I'm just one of the people that offers this advice. Now, sure, I may be the one that has the word introvert on my title, but with a little bit of research, you can make sure that your your mentor is an introvert. You know, I found out Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, was an introvert by literally typing in Ivan Meisner introvert, and there's this blog post that came out saying, "Oh my God, I'm an introvert," and there's a whole article about how he found out. It's not hard to figure it out. But find one person that you resonate with and then focus on learning their specific system. Now, you can focus on a different mentor for networking and sales or leadership or whatever, but one mentor per system and then focus on perfecting it. I always suggest that you have the Henry Ford mentality when it comes to systems, which is, you know, Henry Ford, when he first bought out the mass production vehicle, he said, you can have any color you want as long as it's black, because he didn't want any bells or whistles. He wanted to keep it working and everything getting better and better and perfecting and perfecting that line. And then eventually, I mean, now we can get you know anything we want on a motor vehicle. Same with sales, focus on getting the system right, focus on getting the system perfected and then worry about the bells and whistles later. Don't overcomplicate things at the beginning and don't focus on make, making mass production six different types of vehicles. Focus on one vehicle consistently every time and then add the bells and whistles later. That makes sense. That really makes sense. So let me ask you this. Um, It seems like your career uh, has been an interesting one, but all of us at one point, and I I know you've mentioned some of it, what has been your biggest career uh, challenge? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's an interesting question because you know, while my track record sounds successful, I mean, five multi-million dollar success stories. Well, 
the truth is though, I mean, a lot of those businesses really didn't make me happy. And one of the things that I will tell you is, I mean, I can tell you, I can create a rapid growth business or a rapid growth growth career out of anything. But here's one of the things that I have found to be absolutely true. There is nothing worse than a rapid growth business with customers you don't like in a business you can't stand. So the thing that I would always suggest to people is that that, if you don't get that right first, I see entrepreneurs that are like, oh, I just want to start an entrepreneurial enterprise. Well, I've done that and it made me miserable. And it took me time to work out that any enterprise is not a good one. You need churning out cash and still be miserable because it doesn't fill your soul. So I remember in 2007, I, in, I, my first business out was a telecommunications business. It's all I knew. I started a business doing that. In the first, you know, less than 12 months, we made over a million dollars, you know, within, you know, the space of, uh, I mean, just year three alone, we did $4.2 million. We were the, listed as the, in 2007, I won the award for creating the largest um, brokership of B2B cell phones in the country. It was the Young Achiever Award in, in my home city of Melbourne, Australia. And I remember going home and I should have been so happy. I was miserable. I remember thinking to myself, if this is what success looks like, you can keep it. I was in a penthouse apartment, 270 degree views, multiple cars down in the, um, in the garage downstairs, you know, everything that I could possibly think of making amazing money. And I was, to say I was sad would be an understatement. Why and were you I, miserable? What, what were you, because over I what? Felt, I felt like it didn't matter. I mean, the thing for me is, I mean, sure, I saved some people some money on, on call rates. I just felt like that wasn't my calling. And like you weren't connected to it. Like there was something missing in what yeah, you were sure. doing. And like I you needed more. I could have deluded myself to saying, well, you know, $10, you know, $100 saved on a bill, $1,000 a year, say, you know, $1,000 is, you know, every dollar saved is five, 10 made, depending on the markup of the business. But really, I felt like I was capable of more. I felt like I should be serving more. And I just felt miserable because I wasn't. So I went on a, a journey of self-discovery to find out, how I, how I could be more about congruent with me. And, you know, it's funny. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, yes, I help introverted service providers succeed, but we gave insurance salespeople a bad rap in the past. I worked with one insurance agent that literally said, you know, I just want to help people. I'm like, sure you do. Do you want to help people that make 50,000 or 250? And his answer was, of course, 250 because <laughs> I can sell them more products. And I'm like, all right, not really what I'm going with. Let's look at business owners that um, let's say a person that hustled every day to start a business, hired staff, and now they make 250,000 versus that person that studied hard, got into Harvard, got into that C-level executive job, and now they make 250. Which one of those do you want to help most? He said, well, obviously the small business owner. I'm like, well, why the small business owner? Well, I just feel like they deserve more help. Tell me about that. Well, my grandfather started a farm and I remember he was so in love with his farm and everything he created, but then he got sick. And he couldn't support the farm anymore. He had to sell the farm, let go of the staff. And because he hadn't prioritized his own stuff, he ended up moving into this really small apartment. He goes, I just watched him die in front of the couch watching TV for the last 10 years of his life. I just don't feel like anyone should have to, to live like that. And I know that through insurance products, I could have saved that from happening. I said, great. So why don't we call you the hustle lifeguard instead? So when you meet someone in a networking event, you don't sell say you sell insurance and they scream on the inside, trying to work out how to get away from you. They're like, what is that? And then talk about your passion and mission for helping the hustlers of this world. And then tell a story of your grandfather or someone else that you helped to prioritize themselves in their own retirement. And look, he's got a bunch of really cool products that he uses to leverage cash flow into property and things like that using insurance products. He knew so much about it because he really was passionate about that. But the thing that I found is it doesn't matter what you're doing, the decisions that you made have led you to this point. Your career choices, your degree choices, everything you've done has led you to this. And because of that, my belief is that there is some passion behind what you do and you need to rediscover that. Stop thinking about practicality for a second, rediscover your passion, determine the mission, and as soon as we did that for Nick, it was, oh, I want to help the hustlers of this world in their own small businesses leverage insurance products to make sure they have happy retirements and they don't fall victim to health issues that kill the business that they've been creating. All of a sudden, that dialogue shifted and his congruence and authenticity around everything that he did changed dramatically. Great. Yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. And I think it's really sad that so many people are miserable and feel stuck in their jobs. It's I just think people accept it though, don't they? I mean, yeah, it's like, it's like they feel like I feel with all you know my years of recruiting experience, people are like, if I do this, it's a risk. And I feel like it's the opposite, right? It's I feel like it's more of a risk if you stay in a job or a profession that you hate for your whole life because it's risking your soul, it's risking your mental um 
wellness, <laughs> you know, your happiness. So I, I don't know. I think we just label things and thinking that certain things are a risk when it's it's not. I just think it's based on fear. So um, yeah, so I'm curious, you know, you have all this success and you are an introvert. And I'm not saying introverts can't be successful, obviously. But what is the one attribute that you think you have that makes you successful? I think I ask myself a question every time I hit hardship. And the question is, what if there was another way? I think what it is, is that introverts, well, anybody really, when we hit hardship, we say, this is what everyone else is doing. So this is the way it is. I'm unwilling to accept that. Now, I think in our mindset, we have fight or flight, right? So we are, I'm going to hustle it out. I'm going to grind through it. And entrepreneurs, especially these days, even career professionals, they're so proud of their willingness to grind it out. But that's crazy. If you're not following a system that's going to make your life better, eventually you're going to get tired, exhausted and over it. Now, the other option is just to give up, which people are way too willing to do these days. Because let's face it, even if we make all the wrong decisions in life, we're still not going to starve. Right. So, I mean, the, the, the truth is we'll still have power. You'll still have a roof over our head. Well, it, it, you still life's not as bad as it was 100 years ago when things went really, really wrong. So it's just not bad enough for me. When something goes wrong, I ask myself the question, what if there was another way? And I think that comes from I mean, let's face it, I couldn't read when I was 16 and everyone diagnosed me with dyslexia. And because my mother was willing to say, what if there was another way and found it, my life changed forever. And I think I've carried that into everything that I've done. And I think people are either b believe everyone else saying, oh, there's no other way. It's got to be this. Or they, you know, if it's a career trajectory or something like that, they just, they go, oh, you know, it's not practical for me to do this. It's not practical for me to do that. And right. they just give up. Right. And it's interesting because, you know, people that have learning, dis it's considered a learning disability, correct? Oh, absolutely. Well, right, it's yeah. actually considered a, um, an eye condition. It's a sensitivity to light, but yes, it was okay. considered a learning disability. For so you're time. probably used to, because my son has a learning disability and he's taught a very systematic way of learning, doing it very differently than everyone else. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that actually is an advantage because when he gets older, he's actually going to college next year it's going to be an advantage because he's used to having systems in place and doing things differently. Whereas someone who doesn't have that just kind of goes willy nilly, right? And you just accept it because the world is made for you. You don't have to worry about having a system in place for your everyday life you know, and being think... organized, right? So I actually think it's an advantage. And if you look, uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book, um, uh, gosh, David and Goliath. And a lot of that is about successful people that had learning disabilities. And that disability was actually a positive for them to become successful because they did things differently than someone else, than, than someone who didn't have a disability, if yeah, that I mean, makes it's, sense. It's, it's bad news to be average, right? And, <laughs> and the reason being is people that are disadvantaged they have to find other ways. I mean, for me, the world didn't work for me. So I had to find another way to make the world work for me. And I think you know, a lot of people with disadvantages will, will do that. I think that the problem is though, is people are unwilling to give up being average. And I think that's the problem. I mean, let's face it, when, going back to your last question, people inherit their goals from their mother, their father, their, I don't know, drunk roommate they had in college, and they delude themselves that these are the things that are important to them. So they can spend their entire life charging after that without even asking, you know, why are these things important? And, you know, I, I think there's, there's always a quote that comes to my head when I talk about this. And, you know, I've got a, 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 a podcast that I call, um, call Better Business Coach, and there's an episode 17 called forget about goals why is the key to success and i tell people to set three business goals three career goals and then three personal goals right and i tell them to set one that's selfish to themselves and high achievers can write these goals really quickly and then i say now summarize each one of these goals in 250 words or less including why it's important to you and high achievers they can't come up with a why and then they realize they've inherited these goals and then as soon as you say we'll find different goals their brain goes practically i don't know if i can make money out of this i don't know if i can do it and because of that they then shy away from it and i remind them of this quote by jim Kerry, and he said you know 
And for those that don't know Jim Carrey, famous comedian, he said, my father was a really funny man. He could have been a famous comedian as well. He said, but he decided to make the practical choice, the safe choice and become an accountant instead. Many years later, his father was laid off. Like you were saying, right? If you're not excited about something, you just go through the motions. People are going to see that and it's going to affect you in the long run anyway. So his father was laid off. The family had to do what they could to survive. And Jim Carrey literally had to go and get a job as a janitor at his own high school to help the family pay the bills. Imagine what that did to him. He said, I learned a great deal from my father, but nothing more important than you can fail at what you don't want. So why not take a chance of what you love? And I think people with disabilities have this strength of going, well, I'm probably going to absolutely fail at what I don't want because the pain's not going to be worth the gain. And it's so much harder for me. And because of that, I'm going to map out exactly what I want. And then I'll put the good hustle behind it. Right. Actually, Jim Carrey, you know, a lot of people, I, I don't think a lot of people know how philosophical and inspirational he is. I mean, yeah, he's a little crazy, but he definitely resonates with me, Jim Carrey. He's great. I mean, he's, he really he's amazing. His views on money. He's, you know, everybody should get rich once just to realize how insignificant it really is. Yeah, exactly. I mean, our society is so based on what you have. And um, I think it gets a lot of people into trouble making wrong decisions because Absolutely. of that. Right. So Absolutely. So let me ask you this. How do you think COVID, I mean, we're all experienced this no matter where you are on this planet, right? How has it affected uh, introverts? Well, I mean, a lot of people would probably say it's affected us pretty well, right? Because we like being at home. But in truth, we're at home, a lot of us, with families and kids that have come back from college, and we kind of feel a little bit stuck. We're not getting our alone time like we, we used to. It's funny. So I, you know, um, my wife and I are both very introverted. My wife's a lot more introverted than I am. And I used to go away and I'd speak, you know, a, a, like now I do virtual events. Sometimes I think I've done seven in the last two weeks where, you know, whatever keynote I'm doing, but I'm here for it, not away for it. So my wife, you know, while of course she misses me and I miss her, we do get our own loan times during those periods. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of um, you know, people work, have a husband or, or wife that works from home and the other one goes off to the office so they get their loan time. No one's getting that right now. So a lot of introverts have had to work out how they can create solitary recharge time when they're they're in isolation other introverts that are you know that have complete isolation because they're single have realized that they actually need contact with people or they're still going to climb the walls once their battery is charged they got to do something with that energy right so those are some situations the other thing is that i think what's happened is a lot of leaders don't know how to lead their teams if they can't see them so for introverts, a lot of the times leaders have gone, okay, well, I'm now here, I'm just going to get work done, but they're not contacting the extroverts. So the extroverts are feeling unloved. And a lot of times they're now, they're, they're then reaching out to their manager and saying, I've got these ideas, I've got these ideas, and it, it becomes inefficient. On top of that, a lot of introverts don't know how to tell their managers what they're doing. So a lot of times, you know, it's the squeaky wheel. So introverts have got to realize that right now their leaders are lost. They're hiding under their desks, hoping their management team don't call them and ask them what they're doing because they have no idea. And they're looking for advice and strategies. So in the past, we'd have to bring it up in a meeting and that was such a hard thing. Now we have to understand that we have to reach out and advise and set scheduled calls and do things that allow us to get front of mind in front of our management team and go in with plans. So there are a lot of advantages for being an introvert in this situation. But again, there are similar things. We have to create systems and processes for getting in front of our bosses, for sharing our message. I mean, one of the things, so my, my new book talks about, well, the book's called The Introvert's Edge to Networking. So you'd think it's about face-to-face -face networking, but the whole goal of The Introvert's Edge to Networking is about getting you to network globally in the long run. Because in truth, if you can't articulate the value of what you offer in three minutes when somebody's politely listening, what chance do you have online when you get fractions of a second? And I think a lot of introverts have realized that they can create deep relationships offline, but when they go online, they feel like they have to do that transactional spamming into people's inboxes from a point of desperation. So there's a lot of things that introverts are still struggling with, but again, I would say to every introvert, don't do it just because that's what others are doing. And again, realize that there's a lot of advantages that you have in this new COVID environment that if you learn systems, you can succeed incredibly well with. Makes sense. Definitely makes sense. I actually feel like I'm going more inward. It's pushing me. Like I just, it takes such an effort to reach out to people now. 
Well, a lot of introverts, and there's a lot of studies around introverts not liking Zoom calls um, yeah. and, and then struggling with that. <laughs> I mean, I know for myself, you know, I used to do sales calls and I'd only, um, I'd only do sales calls over the phone. And because of that, I'd walk around my desk and I'd feel, you know, a little bit more energetic because of it. Now everyone's using Zoom, so I'm stuck on Zoom all the time. But, you know, I feel like I develop a better relationship. There are positives to it, but it is, it's a lot more screen time. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my wife and I, I mean, we used to go out for coffee three, four times a week. We go out for dinners quite a, quite a lot. Now it's such an effort to go out once, right? And a lot it of is. times it's the tendency, oh, we'll just get takeaway and we'll just get it sent over. And, oh, we haven't caught up with our friends now for what, a year because they're in another state. And, you know, because of that, you know, you start to have contact less and less. Again, this comes back to what's important to you. If, if your goals are to have strong relationships with friendship groups, then you make it a priority. But if you don't truly know what it is that you want to do in your life and career when you're not fulfilled it's so easy to slide into i'll just watch netflix 24 7 and get takeaway and never get out of my tracksuit pants anymore and just go through the motions the problem is when the world goes back to normal you realize you've lost a lot of stuff so but again is that stuff important to you or not you have to decide yourself i can't tell people that i mean there are a lot of things like i love virtual events because i now can speak from stage at three different events in three different cities on the same day, I, that would take me nine days of transit time in the past. So there are things that I don't want to go back to normal and that I won't let go back to normal. There are other things that I can't wait to go back to normal. But each one of those is because I've decided, not because the environment has forced me to, or I've just accepted it as today's reality. Makes sense, without a doubt. All right, so we are going on to the career cure $50 million contest that all of my guests go through. It's going to be real quick. Okay. So I'm going to ask you three questions. First question is what is a one cure you would give to either career professional entrepreneur um, to cure their biggest mistake that they can make? How would you cure it? Absolutely. So I think the, the biggest cure is to not accept what I call busy procrastination. It's so easy to get lost in unimportant things and stop focusing on the things that are actually going to get your success to where it needs to be. That's awesome advice. I think we're all guilty of that. At least I am. Uh, second question, what is the one cure you would provide to improve corporate America? I think it's embracing the fact that difference is a great thing and that people's learning strategies and people's path to success are just different. I think we, we, we have this view of we'll just impose this success factors upon people and if it either work or if it doesn't. And, you know, we're starting to embrace other cultures, other religions and other skill sets. But I think we need to do a lot more with that. And I, I think we need to realize that we don't learn how to cope with people's disadvantages. We, we need to see them as skills gaps and how we can foster the strength that those people offer while sidestepping those skills gaps. Awesome. And third one, third question is, what is the one cure that you give to someone that feels stuck in their career or business? To, for them to realize that they actually made that choice to be stuck. You know, I, 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 there was a lot of times where I felt like it was, you know, the world affected me. Like I got stuck in sales. That's everyone else's fault, right? That wasn't my fault. You know, I couldn't read. That wasn't my fault. It was just the, the cards that I'd been dealt. You have to sit there and go, what if it was my fault? And now, sure, I mean, sometimes we get some pretty, some bad cards dealt to us. But by accepting responsibility for the problem, we can then start to resolve the situation. But if we, if we're effective at that and saying, no, it's everybody else that's done that to me, or if it's just life in general, there's nothing we can do about that. And I choose to be in the situation where I can do something about it, which means I have to accept responsibility, even if I may not think it's my fault. Right. It's how you react to the situation, right? You're in this bad situation. What am I going to do about it instead of feeling victimized? Absolutely. Great. That's great advice. Awesome. All right. So um, why don't you tell the audience um, any new projects, how they can contact you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously you can type my name into Google and I think I take up the first 10 pages, but uh, <laughs> check out, you know, I provide a ton of free content on YouTube, on LinkedIn, on, on Twitter, Instagram. So whatever your platform is, make sure you consume the content there. Um, and obviously we've been talking about networking. So you're welcome to go and check out the first chapter of my second book, The Introvert's Edge to Networking. You can download the first chapter at theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking. 
I'm going to list everything anyway. So you'll provide me all your information and um, I'll provide the links. So that's great. Anything else you want to add before we say goodbye? No, I mean, the only thing that I would really tell people that are listening at home is that we decide every day who we are and what we believe in. We get a second chance every second. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite quotes. It doesn't mean that I change my religious views every week, but what it means is that I decide on my reality at every moment. And at the moment, if you're feeling pushed down by something that you can't do something, realize that that's your decision. And you may not have all the green lights down the way of fixing that problem, but by starting, you're going to get to that outcome. So don't worry about having it all figured out. Just focus on getting it figured out. Great advice. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. You are an amazing guest. Um, thank you for helping our fellow introverts. It's definitely needed. Um, and folks, don't forget, happy career. Happy life.